Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lynn Marquis with the Coalition for Life Sciences, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus Briefing on, uh, with Dr. William Wolf from the University of Virginia. Um, as usual for these caucuses, when I introduce our speakers, um, what I can say from their bio really doesn't express the um, gravitas of, of who they are and what they've been able to accomplish. And the same goes for Dr. Wolf. He is a distinguished university professor um, and an AT&T professor of engineering and applied sciences at the University of Virginia. Um, he is, among his activities at the university were a complete revision of the undergraduate computer science curriculum, research on computer architecture and computer security, and an effort to assist humani humanities scholars to exploit information technology. Um, he's also, he took leave from the university to serve as president of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, together with the National Academies of Sciences, the NAE operates under a congressional charter and presidential executive order that call on it to provide advice to the government on issues of science and engineering. He also um, served as an assistant director of the National Science Foundation, where he headed the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Um, he did this during the years of 1988 and through 1990. Um, so he's well versed with Washington politics and also science and engineering world. Um, he has a list of uh, societies and memberships, um, professional societies, and awards that he has received through his distinguished career, and uh, almost too much that I can't <laughs> even begin to say it all. So we are very honored today to have with us Dr. William Wolf. Thank you. I, I am, uh, wait a minute, do I need to turn this on? Nope, okay. I am reminded of uh, something that Lyndon Johnson said when he was introduced like that. Uh, he said he wished that his parents were still alive and could have heard that introduction. His father would have been so proud and his mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, they say that where you stand depends on where you sit. So by way of setting some context here. Let me tell you where I sat from 1996 through 2007, namely as, as president of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, you probably know the Academies of Science and Engineering as honorific societies. You can't join. You have to be elected by the existing membership. It's considered to be an extremely high honor. Uh, but the Academies have another mission. They, uh, and, and it's the second mission that's, that's relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. We're a private 501, I still say we. I've been gone from there now for th almost three years, but it still comes out as we. Um, the academies are a private 501c3 corporation, but it's a corporation which is chartered by the US Congress to provide unbiased, authoritative advice to the nation on issues of science and technology. Usually, the science and technology that's relevant to some particular policy um, issue. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but the academies are known for their fact-based, accurate, objective, and complete advice. At any given time, there's between six and 10,000 of the f uh, country's finest minds serving pro bono to work on answering some question which has been asked usually by the federal government. Uh, we, report, we publish a two to three hundred page report every working day. Um, they're all available on the web and uh, if you're not aware of them go to NAP, National Academies Press, edu. One of the uh, reports that we published three years ago was in response to a request in fact from Congress uh, asking the question, what does the United States have to do in the 21st century in order to prosper economically? The result was a report called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. Uh, I'm sure many of you know it, but just in case, um, it said, number one, that by any measure, the United States was doing very well economically, or at least it was at the time we published the report. Um, but it said the leading indicators are not so healthy. Went on to say that the traditional advantage of the US 
economically has been innovation. And so in order to prosper, we need to continue that strength. And to do that, it promoted, number one, we need an educated workforce. So advised emphasis on education. Second, we need ideas. And that implied supporting research. Uh, and then a few other things. Um, and that's certainly, that's certainly true. We certainly need an educated workforce. We need a, a vibrant research base. But I believe that there is actually a whole economy, uh, ecology rather, of interacting laws, regulations, institutions that support innovation. Um, there's got to be a culture that permits and even encourages risk taking. There has to be patient capital available to the entrepreneur. The tax laws must reward investment. There must be adequate and appropriate protection for intellectual property. There must be laws and regulations that protect the public, but also encourage experimentation. And the list goes on and on. I refer to this as an innovation ecology because it's this collection of interacting and interdependent things that support innovation. And just like a natural ecology, each element of the innovation ecology has a niche. And the whole system works best when each component fulfills its role effectively. Also, like a natural ecology, when the environment changes, the elements of the ecology must change too. I'm very fond of a quote by Charles Dar from Charles Darwin. He said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but rather the one most adaptable to change. Okay. Uh, a caveat here. I am neither a lawyer nor an economist. And in some other contexts, lawyers and economists have gotten mad at me for the things I'm about to say. Just, just understand I'm a lay person. Um, and there are some things that just don't make sense to me. And so just take it that way. I'm not trying to uh, pick on anybody's profession. What I'm going to do is run through a series of examples um, of things where I think a component of the innovation ecology is no longer working as well as it might. And I think that we need to take a look at them. I'm going to start with the patent system. Patent system was created over 200 years ago. It was designed for macroscopic physical machines. Um, now, maybe it's still OK. I don't know. But at the very least, it would be surprising if simply tweaks to that original model uh, would work equally well for software or snippets of DNA or pharmaceuticals or business processes, all of which are now covered under the patent system. Um, I'll try and be more specific, but I feel, frankly, vindicated when about three years ago I was speaking to a collection of 30 uh, chief te technology officers in Silicon Valley. Um, every, I don't remember how we got onto the conversation about the patent system, but every one of those 30 CTOs said, that the patent system is broken. Every one of them said that the only reason their companies filed patents was for de defensive trading, not for the original intent of intellectual property protection. Every one of them said that from the perspective of the constitutional intent of encouraging innovation, the system was irrelevant. Um, now, these were mostly IT companies. And a lot of the reason why they said what they said has to do with the speed of, of uh, product development. Um, Craig Barrett was the chairman of the National Academy of Engineering part of the time that I was president. And he is fond of pointing out that 90% of the revenues that Intel receives on the 31st of December are from products that did not exist on the 1st of January that same year. 90% of the revenue. In that context, the notion of having multi-decadal long intellectual property protection is simply irrelevant. 
Um, but that's exactly my point, okay? I'm not trying to pick on, on the patent intent of the patent system, which I think is exactly right. But the technology of today and the technology of tomorrow is so radically different from the technology of 200 years ago <coughs> that the mechanisms of the patent system are just irrelevant. Let me, uh, let me pick on the other piece of intellectual property protection, copyright law. Have, have you ever seen a web page which has the little C with a circle around it, a little copyright symbol? Every time I do, I just break up. Uh, because, of course, that page would not be displayed on my computer if it hadn't been copied at least a half a dozen times. Okay, it had to be copied from the server's hard drive to the server's primary memory, from the primary memory onto the internet, bounced through an arbitrary number of routers, finally copied into my primary memory, and then onto the screen. And what's important to understand is that that page would have exactly zero value if it hadn't been copied. If it hadn't been copied, it would be stuck on the server's hard drive and nobody would have seen it. So the copying adds value. Now, clearly, the person who put the little copyright symbol on the, on the page didn't mean to prevent that kind of copying. But unfortunately, that kind of copying is absolutely indistinguishable from the kind of copying, the stealing of information that the person intended to prevent. Uh, Let me pick on somebody else. And this, this is an older example, and maybe it's, maybe it's going to change. But one of, uh, one of the members of the National Academy of Engineering is a ser serial entrepreneur, uh, very, very wealthy, made most of his money in medical devices, but recently has one of his companies is working on a vaccine for cancer. Now, probably given the nature of, of this caucus, I don't need to say this, but in other audiences I have to point out that I always thought a vaccine was something that you took, that you got before you got sick and it prevented you from getting sick. Well, that's wrong. It is simply something which stimulates the immune system. And so <coughs> um, th this entrepreneur has this vaccine for cancer, uh, but it's not prophylactic. You don't get it before the before the tumor develops, you get it afterwards and you simply, the, the, the immune system is encouraged then to fight uh, the cancer tumor. Um, he claims that this particular vaccine is extremely effective against some very, very bad cancers like pancreatic cancer, which only has a, like a 4% survival rate after five years. Um, he, was, he came to me because he was concerned that this vaccine would never be given to a patient in the United States. Okay, why? Because the FDA's gold standard for testing for safety and efficacy is a randomized double-blind test, ultimately given typically to hundreds or thousands of people. The trouble with his vaccine is it is at the bleeding edge of personalized medicine. The vaccine is created for a person and a tumor. There is only one person in the entire universe on whom it might be effective. So you can't do a randomized double-blind test. Um, now I want to pick on the antitrust laws. Antitrust laws, of course, were passed in the late 19th century and were based on the traditional ec economics of that time. Uh, namely, an economics where value relates to scarcity. Diamonds are more valuable than gold because they're scarcer than gold. Gold is more valuable than copper because it's scarcer. In the marketplace, if I want some scarce object, I have to be willing to outbid the other people who want that object. Well. In certain kinds of software and some other things, um, 
that assumption of scarcity being related, or value being related to scarcity, is turned on its head. The scarcer something is, the less, valu less valuable it is. I suspect you all know Moore's Law. The number of transistors on a chip doubles roughly every 18 months. You might not know Metca Metcalf's Law. Bob Metcalf is the guy who invented the Ethernet, uh, that, that wire that comes out of your wall and plugs into your computer and connects you to the uh, internet. Metcalf's Law says that the value of a network grows as the square of the number of nodes on it. Point is, if you own the only telephone in the world, it's not very valuable. It gains value as more people have it. It's the ubiquity of the phone system that creates value, not its scarcity. Um, I watched this play out in the Microsoft antitrust trial a few years ago. Um, I'm sure you're all, all familiar with that, but let me offer you a perspective. I happen to use Microsoft Word as a word processor. I do not use it because it is the functionally best. I do not use it because it is the least expensive. I do not use it because it is the most bug free. It's probably none of those things. <coughs> I use it because there's a reasonably good chance that I can attach a doc file to an email, send it to anybody in this room, they'll be able to open it, um, edit it, and send it back to me. It is the ubiquity of Microsoft Word that makes it valuable. So it's probably not so surprising that antitrust laws created in an economics where scarcity creates value don't work so well in an environment where ubiquity it determines value. Indeed, I think that in some cases, the government ought to be promoting ubiquity rather than um, restricting it. Whenever the antitrust comes up it, currently, somebody will mention the AT&T breakup. I don't think the AT&T breakup was very important. The thing that was really important was the creation of the RJ11 connector standard, the plug that lets you plug your phone in. Prior to that, there was an absolute monopoly, not only on phone service, but on creation of telephones and what you could connect to the network. Okay? Now, anybody, as long as they adhere to the standard, the RJ11 standard, can connect to the phone system. That created an enormous. Let me finish with the idiocy of the R&D tax credit, which you and your friends tend to reauthorize every year. I think any R&D manager will tell you that the R&D tax credit has essentially zero impact on their decisions. And why is that true? Because taking research from the lab bench into product takes many years. I mean, study after study after study. <coughs> Fifteen years is kind of the consensus, consensus view. Um, if I, as an R&D manager, increase my spending this year in order to capture the tax credit, and the tax credit might go away next year, I will have wasted all of the money that I spent. Okay. Um, the R&D tax credit only makes sense if it's going to last long enough to take something from lab bench to close to product. Um, now, I didn't say it has to be permanent. Okay? It just, there has to be an expectation on the R&D manager's <laughs> part that they're going to be able to capitalize appropriate uh, the results of that research. Um, you can quibble with all of these examples. My, my point is not the examples, but rather that new technology 
sometimes requires a really pretty fundamental rethinking of the elements of the innovation ecology. I think in almost, in every case that I've noted, the intent of the element of the ecology is just right. You know, you really do want to promote people uh, inventing new things by guaranteeing them perhaps a monopoly. But maybe that's not the right mechanism. Okay, it, it may have been the right mechanism for macroscopic physical machines. Uh, you really do want to encourage literary and artistic creation. But maybe the mechanism of copying, which, which made perfect sense when everything was on, either on paper or canvas, but it, it doesn't, it isn't the right control point for the digital world. Um, I'll make just one more observation before I quit. The problem isn't going to go away. Even if we could somehow fix all of the things that I mentioned and some more that I skipped over, um, today, the pace of technology, of technological change is, if anything, increasing. And there's going to be something a year from now, or five years from now, or 10 years from now, which doesn't fit, doesn't work anymore. What we need is some kind of institutionalized mechanism to stand back and really ask, what is the best way to achieve the intent of these elements of the innovation ecology? Um, Let me finish by telling you a story, um, which is only partially relevant to what, I'm, what I've said before, but I'd like you to hear it. Uh, date is June the 5th, 2006. Uh, this is after the Rising Above the Gathering Storm report came out. I happened to be in Beijing. Uh, I was there to attend the annual meeting of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. It turns out that their Academy of Engineering and Academy of Sciences hold their annual meetings at the same time, and so they have a joint opening session. The session was held in the Great Hall of the People, uh, which I learned had a seating capacity of 3,000. And so there were about 12 of us non-foreigners, sorry. Um, so I, there I was with 2,988 of the finest scientific and engineering minds in, in China. But what was really impressive was who was on the dais. Um, the President of China, the Prime Minister of China, and every single member of the Politburo. And the, the President, President Hu, uh, gave the uh, keynote address. The subject of which he said was, what do we need to do in order to make China an innovation-driven country? And it was like he was reading from Rising Above the Gathering Storm. He said education. He said um, intellectual property protection. He said um, research and particular shifting of research to university-based research. Um, and he, it, it just, it was an astonishing speech to hear. Um, if anybody wants a copy, I actually got a copy in Chinese, which I had translated here in the States. What was stunning about it was that everybody who, was, who needed to approve it, to get it implemented, was sitting on the dais. And they were all nodding their heads, yes. And what has happened in the last three years is just incredible. Um, universities are, I <laughs> got a tour of Tsinghua's um, computer science facilities. And I'll tell you, there is no uni university in the United States which has equipment like Tsinghua does, none. 
Um, it's just, again, studying. Okay, so that's my, that's my story. Uh, what, what happens now? Do we take questions? Okay. Oh, hey, hi. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm sorry we had votes and I missed the early part. Um, maybe you're not surprised that we would have a computer scientist at the Biomedical Research Caucus. Certainly considering or a the, physicist. Certainly considering the role of, <laughs> of information technology and um, diagnostic uh, uh, electronics and, and all of that that goes with it and image processing and, and pattern recognition and all of those other things that are part of medicine. But what is, I, I, the, the, I think the, the reason Bill is here is to um, drive home the point to you and the policymakers you represent that um, sustaining, uh, yet building and sustaining innovation um, is not straightforward. It requires creating an entire interlocked, interconnected ecosystem. And the, um, there's some things that we can do and should do in a very direct way. And the appropriations bill that's being considered in committee today, uh, supporting the president's uh, request, um, is uh, almost $7 billion in funding for the National Science Foundation, which is a 7% increase over uh, fiscal year 09. Uh, 510 million for the National Institutes of Science and uh, uh, of, uh, uh, Science and Technology or standards, you know, Bureau of Standards, um, uh, which is an 8% increase uh, over FY09. So those are some of the direct things we can do. But as you heard from Bill, there are a number of other things that we should be doing to improve the climate um, uh, in the public and private sector and where the public and private sectors meet. Um, so it is not enough just to talk about healthy funding from the National Institutes of Health. Um, that is obviously uh, basic to uh, what we're talking about here. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I think Bill not only represents that, but communicates that, uh, that idea. So thank you very much for coming to the Biomedical Caucus, and I will let you uh, field questions. Very good. Thank you. I should tell you that I first met Rush uh, when he was first elected to, uh, to Congress, and uh, I think it was AAAS put on a workshop in Williamsburg, and I had the pleasure of being asked to speak at it. And, uh, the notion that another PhD scientist was going to go to the Hill was just pretty exciting. So anyway, questions? Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you, you should introduce yourself. Oh, yes. Uh, David Stein, Commissioner of Service. Um, what do you think about the patent bills in Congress? Have you looked at them at all that are being debated now? I have no idea. What, what, what kind of policies would you put in place? If you were in charge of patent policy? Um, well, I think the first thing I would do is separate the bills for the various kinds of intellectual property that you want to protect. Um, there's just absolutely no reason to think that there's, there's any commonality to those things at all. Uh, I happen to know software best, and the, the whole concept of software patents boggles my mind. It, it really does. It's, it's like patenting the number three, you know? It's, it's, anyway, um, I have serious, qu uh, maybe I shouldn't say this in this company, but I have serious reservations about the notion of patenting segments of DNA. That's something to me that nature created, not, not humans. Um, But I would have to. I was I was more raising the raising the flag than trying to promote a particular solution. Um, 
What about uh, antitrust laws? You said that um, there might be a better way to do it. How would you it? Um, I am more concerned about the remedies than I am about, um, well, no, I can't say that. First of all, we, have, we need to recognize that a monopoly is not necessarily a bad thing. In some cases, a monopoly actually benefits the public. Um, second, essentially, the, as far as I know, the only thing that's specified in antitrust legislation as a remedy is breaking up the company. And that's going exactly in the wrong direction. Third, uh, I think that um, we need to recognize the importance of using standards as an alternative. Um, for example, if we had broken up Microsoft into a Windows company, a Word company, a PowerPoint company, nothing would have changed. The company would be broken up, but Word would still be a monopoly in its field. Alternative, require Microsoft, don't break them up, but require Microsoft to make the internal disk format of Word a public standard. Okay? So that I can use XYZ data processing, uh, word, pro word processing program, but you can send me a Word file and I can open it, edit it, and send it back to you. Okay? Then you could get some real competition on who's got the most functional, the most bug free, the cheapest implementation. It's, it's the moral equivalent of that RJ11 connector, which, which made it possible for anybody to compete in the telephone business, in the, in the manufacturing end of the telephone business, and to innovate things like fax machines. This may be a naive question, or, or maybe even hard to quantify, but uh, are scientists, the people doing the research, on the same page as, as what you're talking about as, as industry might be? Because it seems that a lot of times when you're talking about patent reform and copyrights, um, antitrust laws, there sometimes are, is a wall between the researcher and the industry that's taking it. Um, you didn't mention it in the introduction, but just by way of providing a little more context, uh, the, sort of the middle third of my career was founding and running a, a small company. Um, small by some standards, anyway. 20 million in revenue. Um, and so I, I sort of have both the academic side of it and the industrial side of it. And I think both sides are incredibly naive about how important their contribution is. Okay. Um, academics tend to totally overestimate the importance of basic research, in my humble opinion. Um, I, was, I was doing a mental, like, sorry, I'm getting off onto a sidetrack, but I can't help myself. I was going through a mental exercise um, in preparation for a course that I was teaching this last semester. And the mental exercise has to do with what's called the linear model. The linear model, which academics absolutely love, says there is basic research, which has to be done first. Then there is develop, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, applied research, then development, then product development. And I was trying to think of any example of important major breakthroughs for which that is true. In fact, most of the time, it goes somewhat the opposite way. There was no theory of aerodynamics before the Wright brothers flew their airplane. There was no theory of thermodynamics before Watt built a steam engine. Okay? Um, I think what actually happens is 
kludgy products get developed first. And then the science gets developed in order to allow you to improve it. Um, but I cannot think of a single example where a major breakthrough, not just an incremental development, but a major breakthrough was made on the basis of some basic research that had been done. Um, why did I get off onto that sidetrack? What was the, oh, yeah, do, 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 uh, do the two sides understand each other? And the answer is no. I find myself translating between academics and industry people all of the time because they think that they're communicating and they're not. Yes. Do you think the US PTO would be better served if it moved towards kind of like the EU's approach towards patent and technology, specifically like reconvening every 10 years to update its patent law? Um, again, I'm not an expert on, on patent law. Um, I gave that example only to make the point that it would be surprising if it was perfect for today's technology, having been modeled on 200 year ago technology, which was just physical machines. So um, I guess to uh, respond to your, uh, your point about uh, major breakthroughs, I think one example that uh, we often use in biology is the HIV protease inhibitor, uh, one of the major classes of drugs that allows uh, allows us to treat HIV infection. Uh, and uh, the protein that is the target of this drug was very obscure and not really thought to be relevant to anything uh, when the basic research on it was done. And it was only after uh, only after it was discovered that there is this virus that causes a disease um, that has a similar protease that it was able to be applied and become a major treatment. Uh, the same could be said of uh, Gleevec, a major cancer drug. So I guess and my question is, so maybe, maybe these are the kind of... They're, they're not they're not the kind of game-changing yeah. things like the invention of the airplane. They're not, they're not game-changing necessarily, but from the perspective of a biomedical researcher where your, your goal is ultimately to try and cure a disease or treat a disease, I mean, this, isn't that what we are here to try to do? And, um, Look, I'm not trying to put down basic research. I'm so simply saying that for the really major game-changing innovations that frequently, if not always, isn't any basic science beforehand, because you didn't know you wanted to do that basic science. Okay? Having a theory of aerodynamics when the only thing that flies is birds is not okay, birds and insects, I guess. There was a hand back over here someplace. Um, do you see, are we on the right track to developing the workforce to support the innovation, um, you know, at the basic level and the higher levels too? Um, but first of all, the short answer is no. Um, I was just talking to a reporter uh, for the Boston Globe yesterday? Yeah, I think yesterday. Uh, who's doing a story on the need of, in particular, the federal government for, um, for a much larger science and engineering workforce, and uh, was reminded of something that Dan Golden said to me when he was still administrator of, of NASA, and that was that um, NASA had twice as many engineers over 60 as under 30, okay? Tremendous knowledge and experience is gonna walk out the door. Um, my wife happens to be on the Defense Science Board, and so we were talking just uh, over the weekend about the fact that order, I think the number is 56% of PhD engineering degrees in this country are given to non-US citizens. 
And that just said, we, we probably don't have enough, we're probably not graduating enough scientists and engineers at the PhD level in the first place. But then you just whack off almost 60% of those that do graduate who are essentially unavailable to major parts of the federal government. Um, there, there's always a, a big debate about, I was, I was president of the Academy of Engineering, I think virtually every day of my tenure there, somebody would raise the issue of are we graduating too many engineers and so salaries might fall, are we graduating not enough? I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is that the salary of engineers has sort of risen with inflation. It's not risen faster than that, so we probably have, an, have enough engineers. It's not falling, so we're probably not producing too many. But 20 to 25 percent of the employed engineers in the country are foreign born. Many are not US citizens, so we have imported them. If you wanted to ask how many engineers would we have to graduate if we needed a all US born and bred cadre, it's probably 25% more than we're currently doing. Yes. Do you think that it would be likely that patients such as China would implement innovation policies such as rising both? Oh, they already have. They already have. It's, it's everything that was in Hu's speech has been codified in their current five-year plan. And, and they've dedicated money to it. They're spending money. And then, so then what would you say? How should you guys respond best to that? Um, well, here I am, I am colored by my experience in the computer industry. I'm a computer scientist, by the way. Um, uh, and the only way you survive in the computer business is to run faster, okay? Protectionism is not a help. <laughs> uh, you just gotta run faster. And we're not doing that right now. Okay, well this has been fun. Uh, I hope it's been useful and uh, Lynn, do you have anything you want to? No, yeah, thank you very much. We have a caucus next Wednesday as well with Dr. Uh, Chad Bolton, who's a geriatrician from the Johns Hopkins University. Um, so, but today we thank you, and, and it has been very eye-opening and <laughs> a little nerve-wracking, but. Yeah. <laughs>